Hello, everyone, and welcome to Collider at Movie Talk. My name is Mark. Happy Valentine's Day to all you lovers out there. And for the rest of us, well, there's always Denny's. What a show we have for you all today. We have some great panelists here, including a special guest. Ladies and gentlemen, from Kind of Funny, Nick Scarpino is here Woo! today. Hello, everyone. Hello. Thank you for having me. And thank, thank you, you for reminding me it's Valentine's Day. I have it to call my wife. Excuse me. <laughs> it's Valentine's Day. Nick does have a wife as well as a tremendous beard. Somebody who, uh, John Schnepp, you and Holly are now officially tied the knot. Uh, no, not yet. But, not uh, yet. Yeah, we're going on uh, multiple years. Hey, happy Valentine's <laughs> Day, Holly. Woohoo! A lot of cats, too. A lot yeah. of cats in that relationship, oh, yeah. and they're all adorable. Last but certainly not least, well, you go from a cat to Sending the Wolf of the Sending the Wolf podcast, the one, the only, Classy Clark Wolf. Which my uh, movie talk valentine, Mark Ellis, is my <gasps> guest this week, mm -hmm. so you got to check that out. We talked about Good Morning Vietnam, and it was great. On Wednesdays, we wear pink, and it's also Valentine's Day, so we have a whole lot of great stories to get to, <laughs> including LeBron James is going to be involved in House Party. That sounds like a hoot. A Call of Duty movie could be in in the works and it could be a shared universe but we kick off today with black panther it is the week of the black panther release here in the united states and the box office tracking just keeps going up what a shocker the hollywood reporter is now saying that the box office tracking outlet nrg is counting a possible 165 million dollar opening for the four-day president's weekend for black panther this is the same group who said black panther would top out around 125 million then they updated their report to 150 million so if the numbers hold this would place black panther as the marvel cinematic universe's best opening ever for a solo character and it would be on track to beat the current february record which is deadpool that opened to 132 Point four million dollars. So the easy question I will throw to my money manager, Nick Scarpino, yes. is Black Panther going to be for a three day? Because let's I, I, I love President's Day. It's nice that a lot of people get Monday off, including us, which I was just alerted to. Let's just talk about the three day weekend, because that's what it's competing against with Deadpool. Is Black Panther going to defeat Deadpool as the highest grossing February flick? I would say so. I would think so. This movie has a tremendous amount of energy going into it, a tremendous amount of buzz. And Everyone I know that's seen it said it's well worth the money. So I think it's going to go. On. I'm excited to see it. I haven't seen it yet. I have to see it with the rest of the general audiences on Thursday because I'm not as cool as everyone else here. <laughs> uh, and for the for the 15th time in my life, I want to be Mark Ellis. But um, I'm looking forward to it, and I think it can do it. You got to stop living in San Francisco and I, just move down to Hollywood. You let's get call in my these, wife right now, you and me. These we'll fancy screenings. But the thing about Black Panther is, and you noted this right before we went to air, is that it broke records and it actually outpaced Captain America's Civil War. Or as far as pre-sales go, is the pre-sale number what you're basing your prediction on, or is it just all of the buzz and all of the positive critical reception it's gotten so far? I would say both. I would say both. I mean, this business, this movie's been making stories for the last two months with the sales, so I don't see it stopping anytime soon. And I think it's got it doesn't have any competition at the box office that weekend either. So. What's going strong? Yeah, Clark, I don't think Fifty Shades Freed is going to be putting up much of a fight against Black Panther. Do yeah. you think that it's going to be Deadpool? And do you think it can actually get to that lofty $150 million, $165 million number? I do. I do. And there, there are a couple reasons for that. The first is, and we've talked about this on Movie Talk before, um, this is an event. This is an event movie. African-American people have not seen themselves represented in this way on the big screen for a mainstream superhero literally ever. So uh, that, no, Blade, sorry. No, no. Well, that's what. OK, um, so um, that said, this is this is more mainstream, I would say, than than Blade. Right. I mean, look, Wesley Blade. Snipes was my favorite actor as a Blade, kid. For Blade, a time I mean, thing. Blade yeah. was a mainstream movie. I understand what you're saying, but let's just get it right. Blade is the first one. Okay. Everyone I, sleeps on Blade. It's true. I, I'm not sleeping on Blade, but I think what we're talking about is something that is very different than Blade. Sure. Uh, which leads into the second point that I was going to make. It has the backing, backing of being a part of the MCU. It has momentum from all of these other films leading into this. So introducing Black Panther and Civil War um, and setting us up for his solo adventure um, has that progression that is, I think, really, really important. Um, it's, I think, you know, Deadpool didn't really, I know Deadpool is part of the bigger uh, universe of comic books, but what I'm saying is he had not been introduced in this way um, and didn't have a series of films behind it leading in. Wonder Woman 
similarly, yes, had Batman v Superman and was a part of a bigger universe, but only had, what, two films, I guess, leading up to that, whereas this is, as we know, a 10-year adventure. This is something that's 10 years in the making. So I think for those two reasons, it's going to be huge. Yeah, I mean, Shep, you look at the perfect storm and a confluence of events, if you will, and yeah, Blade certainly was based on a comic book, but it was a, di it was a very different landscape back then when Blade was coming out, because that was the dawn of this modern era of comic book movies we get, where you have Blade or you have an X-Men, and then for the first time, we're looking on it, and it's not even necessarily about representation as much back then, because we're just like, oh my God, this is a comic book movie, and it came to life on the big screen in a cool new way. Now, you have all these Marvel Cinematic Universe movies, like Clark mentioned, and you have the MCU that is just making boatloads of cash every time out of the gate, and then you have something like Black Panther, where this is exciting because it is a standalone movie, even like Thor Ragnarok, which is you're leaning on multiple characters to sell that movie. This is Black Panther's story that people are paying money to see. Once you see that, you're going to see a whole lot more than just Black Panther, but that's the one that's leading the charge. Yeah, I mean, outside of Blade, you have Halle Berry's Catwoman, you have Will Smith and Hancock. There's a lot of films sure. featuring black superheroes in lead roles that, that open. Black Panther is a lot different because of many things. Not only did it get an incredible lead-in with Civil War, it was one of the greatest introductions to a character, period. And Black Panther is a great character, as anybody who reads comic books knows about that. A lot of the general audiences don't know who Black Panther is. They found out in Civil War. Then you get Ryan Coogler directing this film, Black Panther. You see the trailers for it. It's it's following the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and it's also African American representation. I mean, Wakanda is like when when you see it, you'll be like, wow, I want to live in Wakanda. So I mean, I think that's kind of the 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 thing why it's going to be 165, maybe 170 million dollars, and it'll be an unstoppable thing because people are going to want to see this again and again. It's a repeat viewing type of film. Yeah, how much of this excitement and buzz that a lot of comic book fans are seeing? Because I, I think that we, we can all surmise that Black Panther is going to do very well opening weekend regardless. But the fact that we got to see a taste of Black Panther in Civil War and that he was such a beloved character just from that brief screen time he had, how much does that drive the box office sales for this standalone movie? Well, I think it increased it quite a bit because people saw saw who this Black Panther is. They want to see him in his solo adventure, and then you see the trailers for the solo adventure. Like that's exactly what I wanted to see. So I think it. I think Marvel Cinematic Universe. I mean, Kevin Feige and everybody there is just really running the game right. I mean, they're sort of like, oh, that's what they want. But let's give it to them. So. Right, Nick. Do you think that if Black Panther gets to that 165 million dollar number, what do you think that that does for the future of superhero movies, of more representation in superhero movies? Well, I certainly think you're going to see a Black Panther two at some point very, very quickly. <laughs> um, I think it's, I, you know, I think it obviously furthers it, but I think more importantly, it's uh, the thing I love about what the MCU is doing right now is they give you pretty much the exact same thing every single time, only a skosh different, and and uh, and they do that so very, very well. What I like about this is you can go forward, you can really do anything in this universe now. That's what this is proving to me is that like you can give everyone something that's unexpected and still have it hit the same level of quality in the same mark and give it to them over and over and over again. I went into Thor Ragnarok thinking this is going to be another Thor movie, was not excited about it all at all, loved the fact that it was 80s inspired, 70s and 80s inspired, but was not expecting much, and I got a Jeff Goldblum love fest, and I loved it. <laughs> it was fantastic. They gave me exactly what I wanted, only a little different, and that's what I expect every single time. Okay, Clark, I'm going to you first, because if, if, if you don't have to play the numbers game. Nobody has to play the numbers game, but I would love to put the definitive number on on Black Panther and its opening weekend because this is my last live movie talk of the week. I got to go to Philly and New Jersey. So, Clark Wolf, what do you think this movie is going to make? I'm going to go four day weekend. I'm going to go four day weekend over President's Day. When we wake up on Tuesday morning and we see the figures there, what's the number? I'll go 210. 210. I'm going to go high. She's going high. I'm not with playing prices right rules here. <laughs> All right. I'm, go, I'm going $1. high. 210. <laughs> Total. Peter, do you want to go a dollar? I'm going to go a dollar. I'm going one dollar. <laughs> All right. Uh, John Schnapp, what is your what is your number for the four? One hundred and seventy eight million dollars. One hundred and seventy eight million. I'm going to go one eighty. Sorry. I, was, I already had one eighty in my All head. Right. So you got one seventy eight, one eighty, two ten from Clark Wolf and Nick Scarpino. Bam. One dollar. <laughs> 
<laughs> he's coming under everybody. So he's taking the low ball there, but it's still, I mean, is it really a low ball if you're just going under $178 million? <laughs> that is what is looking right now for Black Panther. Very exciting weekend. And uh, as somebody who's seen the movie, I can recommend that if you haven't bought your tickets yet, go ahead and snatch them up while there's still a seat left in your theater because you will not regret it. We move on to LeBron James is throwing a house party. Remember the house party movies? Okay, yeah, first of all, a lot of people say that I look like Chris Kid Reed, and it depends on what kind of haircut I got that day, but I get that more often than I would like to admit. So let the memes come. I know it's going to happen. I enjoy them. I welcome them because I love the house party movies when I was a kid. And now LeBron James is set to produce a reboot of those house party movies. This is according to The Hollywood Reporter, that LeBron James. It's going to be a reimagining of the classic 90s comedy series House Party. Atlanta's Stephen Glover and Jamal Alori will pen the screenplay. This is definitely not a reboot. It's an entirely new look for a classic movie, James told The Hollywood Reporter when he wasn't managing his brand new teammates on the Cleveland Cavaliers. Not much else is known about the project, and a release date has not been determined at this time. Clark Wolf, the big question you and I both had as soon as we heard this story is, what does this do to the Space Jam movie that we had heard about that I LeBron know. was going to be involved in, whether producing or starring in? If I give you the option of a House Party reboot or the Space Jam movie first with LeBron James involved somehow, which one do you want? I'm going. I'm going house party. I'm going house party. I. I'm. Not, even though I was a child of the right age, I never really was into Space Jam. I'm sorry. Now, if you get Bill Murray back, <laughs> then maybe I'm on board. Um, but uh, but I do think you know LeBron has a really successful. Um, uh, producing career on television, in addition to a bunch of things that he has in the works. Survivor's Remorse on Stars was was very popular. It ran for four seasons um, and had a lot of critical love. Um, and the audience who watched it loved it. So I think that that's great. And I love that I, LeBron is such a smart businessman. He is so smart. And the idea that he is getting into this game now is really, really, I just, I, my hat's off to him. Yeah, Shep, you may have been able to tell over the years of our interacting and friendship that I'm kind of a small sports fan. And yeah. I, I get excited <laughs> when I hear LeBron James is producing anything because I'm a fan of LeBron. I love his game. And I also, I, I appreciate somebody who has reached an icon status, in my opinion, in the right way, where he's had very few missteps in his career professionally. And so now if he's lending his name to something like House Party, which is already something I was a fan of from being a kid, I'm going to be a fan of it. But I also watched LeBron probably 60 games in the regular season and every playoff game as somebody who is not as big into the NBA as I am right what does the name LeBron James do for you and combine that with a house party remake LeBron James the name does for me it reminds me of uh 2003 uh, Orlando Jones I had to animate LeBron James <laughs> as a basketball head I remember oh LeBron just put his head on a basketball and bounced him around yeah. for a sketch for a TV series uh late night TV that's a good talk history show. you have with LeBron yeah and that's yeah. how I first got introduced to him I was like who's LeBron James that's and that's really how I kind of remember him until train wreck and then I was like wow he's really funny mm -hmm. so I you know I used to play basketball when I was a kid where's my camera so anyway um yeah so but LeBron James <laughs> is really funny and it's obviously he's like he's he's producing and making a ton of different television shows and now movies so with remaking House Party I don't know who's going to play the eraser head that's all I want <laughs> yes Scarpino I, I I dare say that up in your neck of the woods San Francisco LeBron mm. might not be quite as popular we don't like these him that days. much we don't like him that much just because the Golden State Warriors are up there and it's it's hard for me to see LeBron and this new squad of the Cavaliers defeating them this year if they make it to the finals again but is LeBron LeBron going to win the championship at the box office with the house party? I think he will. I mean, house party is a known brand, but I'm all for this, by the way, if they do what they wanted to do with Bill and Ted and just catch up with kid and play right now. <laughs> yeah. It's modern day. What are they doing right now? They're in their mid fifties. Should just they be out. in the movie? Because I think they should. Yeah, I, they I think be you can movie. remake the movie and they can be like the parents yeah. and then, or, or whatever they are. They can be circumstantially related to have the to events. Be. Have to be. Why not? Why not? It's fun. I love that idea because that's what they're going to do with the Goonies. They're going to have the Goonies and then it was their kids. That was the Richard Donner idea, the sequel right. of the Goonies. Why not do it with House Party? Have them be the parents. Yeah, and I would argue that I think that House Party for uh, for a large sect of the population is as culturally relevant as something like a Bill and Ted was for a lot of people's childhoods or, or the Goonies or something like that. So I think House Party is, is bankable, but LeBron is now kind of crossing over to that stage in his career where he's got years left and he might come to Los Angeles to play basketball 
basketball next year or the year after. If that doesn't happen, though, he still wants to be involved in Hollywood. I want to get your take first, Nick, and then everybody else. What do you think about somebody like this in this stature in 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 athletics moving on to produce movies mm -hmm. and television content are you a fan of it or does it strike you as a little odd no i'm always a fan of anyone with that work ethic coming and trying to apply that to other things right like you don't get to where lebron james is without putting the work in and it sounds like he's very passionate about things like this like being in entertainment my question is how much does a guy like that really have time to be on the ground floor <laughs> of a movie right is he going to be on set every day is he going to be working with the writers or is he going to be basically just loaning his name to the production to get funding for it and making sure that it's it's going forward yeah how much of a producer is is he actually going What's to What's he be, really going to be doing? Right? Yeah. Is he going to be there day to day or is it just going to be, let's put this out there, make sure it's great, get some great people attached to it, move on to the next thing? Corey, is LeBron going to be hands on or do you think he's just going to be kicking back, letting this thing happen and just cashing a check? I think that he definitely has creative instincts and comedic instincts that that he's applying to these things. And also, I mean, the idea that that he like the idea that he is putting his name or or getting involved in a Space Jam reboot. Brilliant idea. House Party. Very smart. Something like Survivor's Remorse. He's got documentaries like these are all things that make sense for the LeBron James brand. And so I, I, I while still kind of pushing outside just a little bit and expanding. So I do, I mean, I would guess that he is involved. I don't know if he'd be on the ground floor every single day, but I, I, I would, I would have a hard time believing that he wasn't creatively excited and involved and entrusting. That's how, by the way, that's just how most celebrity, most famous people who have production companies, that's kind of how they do it also. Um, so yeah, I would imagine that he's, he's involved. Yeah, Shanep, uh, this it, it, technically a Hollywood outsider coming into more your territory. Do you welcome that? Yeah, man. I don't think he's going to be like a weekend warrior. I think, I mean, with technology now, they could be sending him, you know, like takes and cuts, like in between his practice or whatever. Like, I, I'm guessing he probably like cuts off whatever he's doing during the day and then puts on his producer hat at like maybe four to seven and watches cuts from all the different shows he's working on. I mean, that would be my guess. And if he's if he's even more peripherally involved, like maybe on the TV show end, he's already hired other producers that have got his back. And that's kind of the whole thing with when you're working in the production world, you're working with a bunch of other people. You want to make sure that everyone that you've hired is doing is going to be doing a great job so that you can relax a little bit and not be have to micromanage everything. So it sounds to me like he's not going to be micromanaging everything. He's going to be like overall checking things out. That's how I would run it. Yeah. And after games, when he's in the hyperbaric chamber for two hours, what better way to cool down than to watch dailies from the new house party reboot. I'm pretty excited about this. <laughs> Please tell me that's true. I, I, I Oh, he's, Does he I, do that? I have studied LeBron James's training to a T. Do I follow it? Of course I don't. I go to Carl's <laughs> Jr. Way too much for that, but I see what he eats every day. Yeah. I see how he plays. I see what the practice schedule is like. And yes, he does recuperate with hyperbaric chambers, something I have not investigated yet, but um, I still get my daily nap. And so Sleep, it's the key to life, kids. Uh, we want to remind you guys that this weekend, speaking of Black Panther and all the success it's going to have at the box office, we are going to be doing something very special in coordination with the Black Panther Unmasked Studios event created by Brisk. We are going to be interviewing the Black Panther costume designer Ruth E. Carter live on stage as part of a very special live movie talk. It's going to be hosted by yours truly. Joel Monique is going to be there. John Schnepp is going to pop in. Yeah. It's this Saturday, February 17th, Saturday at 2.30 p.m. This is downtown Los Angeles. Make sure you guys get there early because space is limited. Cannot wait to partner up with Brisk and put on this live movie talk for all of you Black Panther fans out there. Very excited excited about that. Something else we're excited about is a new segment here, Switch the Script. This is presented by our friends at Boost Mobile, and this is something that we did yesterday where we put Thanos into the MCU a little earlier than some people wanted on the panel. I thought it was a great <laughs> idea, so now I'm going to borrow an idea from James Cameron for today's Switch the Script, and that's the ending of Terminator 2, because we all saw the end of Terminator 2. We saw the thumbs up. We saw the road at the end, and it kind of led to a apocalyptic, we're still not sure what's going to happen, we're worried about the future kind of vibe. What if Terminator 2 had the, the script switched and it ended happily ever after, Schnepp? What if, as was a scene that was filmed and then cut from the movie, but you can check out on YouTube now, it ended with Sarah Connor, Linda Hamilton, as a happy grandmother, and she's sitting on a playground watching her son, John, now a senator, push a kid on a swing, and we all feel good about it. 
Do you like how I switched the script today? Absolutely not. I'm glad that they <laughs> left it on the cutting room floor. I, I trust James Cameron's instincts. You know what? He wanted to he wanted to mirror the beginning and he wanted to mirror that uh, dream sequence that Sarah has with the kids in the playground and show a happy ending with her as a grandma and like you know the the kid and her and her son is now uh, you know has kids of his own. So, um, but I like that dystopian type of ending that the actual movie did have it's it had a hopeful ending but it was like you know it all depends on what we do it's like it's up to us to not screw up the future and here we are in 2018 so it's one of those <laughs> things where you like go back in time you'll watch these science fiction films like yeah we screwed up how did we screw up you know so you're watching these films trying to give us a hint as to not to do the wrong thing and we're like, yeah we did the wrong thing 2018 what's up that's why so, i want to end it halfway ever after no way because, screw because that there's no, and, and you talk about screw ups i think one of the screw ups that you could say with the terminator franchise nick is that as great as an ending as t2 had mm. it set up sequels mm. and this way if it ends happily ever after there's not as many sequel opportunities so you don't get your rise of the machines or your salvations or your jenny smiths and then if you want to reboot it you can but you don't have to build off that and try to follow up terminator 2 because no terminator movie has yeah i mean i'm split on this right because there's there's been really no happy ending for sarah connors at this point like we just really haven't seen her character get any she's she, totally no luck whatsoever she just keeps kind of getting thrown <laughs> back into the fray which we love obviously as moviegoers because we want to see more of that so on the one hand i do love the idea that she gets to live happily ever after on the other hand i do love the idea that they're shucking the rest of those things you talked about and starting over from terminator 2 going forward now kind of cool and we do need it open-ended to be able to do that so okay know. so uh, we're getting open-ended is the way to go clark wolf I'm going to you for Happily Ever After. Sarah Connor is a nice grandma, and it's on the playground, and oh, there's John and the kids, and we all made it. Yay or nay? Yay. I give it a yay. I actually, so here's why. Because <laughs> Linda Hamilton, you know, we know that she's signed on or going to be a part of the new Terminator movie that, that they're working on. Right. Um, but we haven't seen her as Sarah Connor since. So it's like, I kind of want to give Linda Hamilton's Sarah Connor a real happy ending. I like that for her. And additionally, if the Terminator, if there ever was a period of time or timeline where time travel was possible, then what's to say that if you wanted to open it back up again and you give Sarah her happy ending that you couldn't find a way to incorporate the time travel from an alternate timeline back into the franchise. You totally could. So I, I want to give her a happy ending. <laughs> All right. I got one. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> I got one, and that is my happy ending for Switch the Script. We're going to go from that, a new segment, into an old favorite that I didn't even tell the production crew we are going to try to do, and that is buy or sell. This Woo! is the part of the show where we simply say whether we buy or sell, and then we defend our choice to the death based on what the topic is, and the first one is the new trailer for Rampage Drop. Mm -hmm. It's starring a guy you may have heard of called Dwayne The Rock Johnson. Warner Brothers and New Line are teaming up for this. It's his latest action film, and it reteams The Rock with his San Andreas director Brad Payton. Inspired by the 1980s video game Rampage, stars Johnson as a primatologist, Davis Okoye, whose best friend is an intelligent silverback gorilla named George. That is, until a rogue genetic experiment transforms the ape into a giant monster, sending him on Rampage across the nation with a 30-foot flying wolf and, dear God, a huge gator by his side. The film arrives in theaters on April 20th, 2018. Classy Clark Wolf. You bought my happy ending. Are you buying the new trailer for Rampage? Yeah, I'm buying it. That doesn't sound like you're I buying know, it. I know, because <laughs> I feel like, you know, I kind of want to be like, all right, The Rock. Like, you know you have all of our money. And But I, one thing that they did in this trailer that I really do like, that did win me over, is... Um, is is drawing attention to the fact that this is insane. Like <laughs> this whole premise is completely ridiculous. And so you know, with the rock say when he's the wolf is flying towards it, he's like, of course the wolf flies. Like it was like okay, this is gonna be because I would I would say that as much as I love the rock, sometimes he comes off a little self serious for me in in some of the more ridiculous movies that he is in. Now he's very funny and has a great when he's doing comedy, he's wonderful. But but, but so, I'm glad that, that we are doing this. And I don't know if I have said this on the show before, but uh, I love that this is coming out on 420. Uh, I think that yeah. is the perfect day for this to come out. 
And um, all of this is legal in California, what mm-hmm. I'm alluding to. So, uh, yeah, so I'm on board for this 420 adventure. I'm not sure what you're alluding to. Is yeah. extra butter on the know. popcorn? Because that's what that, I'm eating when I totally see special the Special butter. That's, um, butter is legal in California. That's what I was getting you at. Can, and, and, and you can pump as much as you like. Yeah, and you can even go to the concession stand. You can say, just fill it up a quarter of the way. I'm going to go put some butter in it, and I'll be right back with you. And then everybody else in line is like, come on. Like, when I see that happen in line, Schnepp, I'm, I'm annoyed because it takes longer for me sure. to get to the counter, but I'm a little impressed, too. Because yeah. anybody that has that commitment to butter is somebody that is probably going to see Rampage on Well, they're also just a smart moviegoer, you know, because they know <laughs> they're going to get to that dry but- the dry popcorn part in the middle of the film, and it's like, yo, so they're setting themselves up. I am up. that person. Yeah, I, I, I am person. that person, too, and I have zero guilt. Suck it. Um, you know what? <clears throat> Rampage is amazing. <laughs> <clears throat> I played the game when I was a little kid. I love it. And when I first heard about them doing a Rampage movie, I was kind of, I was in the middle of my Tetris irritation, but I was like not as irritated. But I was like, what are they going to, how are they going to do Rampage? Then I saw the first trailer. I was like, all right, they've actually done it. And then this second trailer just put me over the edge to actually really wanting to see the film. And it is kind of like, I'm going to see two rock movies every year. And that's what I want to see now. And I'm like, I just know that (laughs) rock has my money, Jumanji eight, whatever it is he's doing, black Adam, it doesn't matter what he's doing. He's just an entertaining actor and his, the way he plays off things. Like when he said, of course the wolf has wings. I mean, that could have been done too comedically. If some other actor was doing it too over the top, he did it perfectly. He delivers his lines perfectly. He is like a live action superhero type of a guy. I wouldn't be surprised if he inhales some of that weird mystery and turns into a giant dude. Oh, um, you know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know what's fantastic. gonna happen in this movie, but I'm all in. I love that they have the three crazy cr- creatures that you could play as a, as a on the video game, the old school video game, but now it's updated where I can actually watch it. This is a way to make a watchable video game movie. That's what it feels like to me. Like, it's not like the playing dynamics of, of the fun of what you, what you how when you played it, and now it's something completely different. Yeah, and looking back on it, it's, it, it's almost like San Andreas was a practice range for for Brad Payton and The Rock to just be like, okay, what can we do with the facts? Right. What can we do with this? Let's just destroy some cities. And and then, but that was too much of a disaster movie where you had to take it seriously and Paul Giamatti had to react really stupidly <laughs> to stuff. So this one, it, now we take all the serious you know, human interest elements out of this and we're really just worried about The Rock and George. And as long as they make it out okay, mm-hmm. Nick, we're going to be happy. I'm telling you anything right now. I'm buying whatever The Rock is selling. Yeah. Okay. With the exception of... Baywatch, which we all got a little burned by, no pun intended on that one. Uh, but he brought it back with Jumanji. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's fantastic. And you, to your point, yeah, he's making like three or four movies a year. So one of them, every once in a while, is going to dip a little bit. Right. But for the most part, you look at The Rock's career in movies, and it has been nonstop fun pretty much since, what was it, The Rundown? Was the first really big breakout movie yeah. we did? We will give the Tooth Fairy a pass. We're like, that's not really part Everyone of wants yeah. a paycheck every once yeah. in a while. I mean, you start out with a Scorpion King, and it's like, yeah, they're trying to put a wrestler in this movie. And right. then he just started creating this incredible career based on his wrestling persona but then you bring up Baywatch and it's like is this guy just is he the most Teflon actor we have and what could possibly happen in his career professionally not anything personally that that we see a movie and we're so burned by it that we get turned off to the rock because if Baywatch didn't do it it's hard for me to imagine any movie coming out that's worse than that. I think also people, though, have a respect for like the idea that, like you said, Nick, everybody has a stinker every now and right. again, and that's okay. He's making pop entertainment. He's making mainstream pop entertainment. And so it's like, yeah, I mean, if he's making all these movies that are crowd pleasers, one or two of them isn't going to please the crowd in such a way. Mm-hmm. So I, it'll be really interesting to see how much longer he pursues family-friendly or box office-friendly entertainment, and if he starts making takes a turn, takes a turn, uh, kind of like, you know, like we were talking about Will Smith earlier, maybe going for his Ali or his concussion or his pursuit of happiness or whatever. I'd be curious about that. And that might turn people off. Well, I know you guys are all excited about The Rock, but we also have Skyscraper coming out in a couple months yes. after this. Uh, I mean, is that going to turn, p- could that be the movie that's like, okay, stop making so many blockbusters, yeah. we can only handle you two times Do you mean year. Sky Hard? Um, yeah, you know, I'm going to see that movie too. <laughs> <laughs> Look, kids, if you're like The Rock, great. Keep trying to take big swings and making blockbuster movies. My theory is you're never going to let people down if you're mediocre every time. 
That's what I try to do here on this show. We are actually going to add a segment right now because I just heard from Collider.com, this is reported um, that the Call of Duty movie is actually happening. There's going to be a Call of Duty movie, and it's not just a Call of Duty movie based on the popular video game. It's going to be a shared universe. There's going to be a franchise. might try to incorporate other video games in there. And per Variety's report, filmmaker Stefano Salima is who the helmer of Sicario 2 Soldado, which is upcoming. He's a director on that, and now he's negotiating to be the director of the first Call of Duty wow. movie. So if you hear this news, John Schnapp, does this get you excited? Is this going to be the movie, coupled with Rampage possibly, that really turns the tide with video game movies? It's a really, that's a, that's a hard one, because like Rampage it was a game I played as a little kid. It's an old school, like almost like Sega. I mean, it's like very pixelated, like a little ape, like I'm calling a bill, I'm eating a person. And then <laughs> Call of Duty is a game that I've invested untold hours into multiple <laughs> different versions of Call of Duty. I've gone to outer space, I've killed Nazis. I mean, this game runs the gamut. Um, all the different iterations of Call of Duty is one of the most exciting uh, first-person uh, first person shooters I've ever played in my life and so engaging. So to me, uh, I've been a little reticent to hear about a Call of Duty. I'm like, what is this going to be like a bunch of, you know, it's going to be like a, a war film, but it's not going to capture the kind of, um, you know, the vitality that you get as a player in playing Call of Duty. Then you hear Sir, the Sicario director, I'm, I'm in. You know, it's like, I, I feel like, I haven't seen Sicario 2 yet, but uh, I'm looking forward to seeing, like, like, look, if he worked with Denis and Denis helped to develop this guy as a director, then I'm kind of, I'm kind of feeling like I'm, I'm more in as far as like the approach that they're gonna take mm -hmm. with the Call of Duty. If they're gonna franchise it, how are they gonna franchise it? I could see them saying it's a shared universe, but you gotta get the first one done right first. And I could only expect it to perhaps even be done in a POV, first person type of way with a lot of you know cameras mounted, which is how a lot of uh, operations are done anyway nowadays. Yeah, I mean, with, with the Sicario 2 direct director on board that gets me more excited because of the angle we're going to be taking because call of duty can be looked at by a lot of 10 and 12 year old kids as something that that glorifies war and violence and you don't necessarily want that in a movie just because it's called call of duty you want it to feel like it's real life and you actually care about these people so i think as long as you're going in that vein it certainly is going to be profitable nick i mean every time one of these games comes out they make a hundred million dollars on their first day because people are lined up around the block with the pre-sale numbers already kicking in let's get this game in our homes and people are going to want to go out to the theater and see it. I mean, I think it was Modern Warfare or Modern Warfare 2 that was the highest selling entertainment property ever. And now I'm not talking about game. I mean, entertainment property, period. Uh, period. Yeah. So you've got an install base of millions of people around the world that know the Call of Duty brand. Not only that, you can really do anything with it. There's no, there's not like a, 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 a hero of the Call of Duty franchise, right? You're not looking at Master Chief for Halo. You're not looking at like a, a Batman and well, Wallace. Batman and Batman, but um, <laughs> you have a, it, Call of Duty is a nebulous thing, right? It spans any time period. It spans any it, you've got from World War One all the way up to the future of space combat. So you can really do anything in the sandbox. There's a lot. My thing is if they can get close to 50 percent of the tension they built in the first Sicario movie, right? right. Which Denny Villeneuve was phenomenal with, right? right? If they can get there, you got a really good war movie on your hands. Yeah, Clark, do you think that this is the, the franchise blockbuster that we think it all could be just based on the video game stats, or is there another factor at play? I honestly have no idea. I really don't, because of what Nick was alluding to, like the idea that there's not a central character necessarily that you're following. Is that I've, I've not played the game, but that's what you're saying, right? Yeah, you know, like every, it, every game you're playing a different character. Yeah, different like, groups. Right. In but some it, games, multiple characters. Yeah, is, but but is there a too. narrative? There is. There's, I mean, there's a loose storyline right, that takes loose. you through different adventures. Yeah, but it's I mean, not as clear cut as something like Tomb Raider. Right. Where, uh, right. There, 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 no. There's there, there, there's Lara Croft and and she's looking for her dad and her dad might right. be dead. So now I got to go find this artifact. It's a little more like a real war where you you're thrown right. into the middle of this conflict. Right. And Call of Duty when it first began, you were going through different different wars through time, and mm -hmm. that, then now we've obviously now we're in the present day. So I feel like I mean, look, if they're if they're getting the Sicario two director involved, I think that you know they're probably gonna they're going to ground it in the present day. I don't know what kind of techniques. I, I don't know if they need to do a you know first-person POV through the whole thing. That would be a little irritating. I would like it to be made more like a film. But in the same sense, I mean, you're talking about the Call of Duty franchise, so you want to incorporate a little of that energy, a little of that vitality that you get from being a player. But it's it never translates. It, 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 like Doom, all these video games where right. they try to translate it, like add those video game elements to it. It doesn't translate. What you're trying to make is you're trying to make a film 
from a video game. So you have to make a film first. You have to think story first. So well, that's that's the uphill. Sorry to interrupt you. That's the uphill battle with a, a game like Call of Duty, right? Mm-hmm. Which is a lot of people. Anyone who's played Call of Duty for longer than you know one or two games. Well, <laughs> yeah. what, what what's your main play type, right? You don't play oh, the first. You don't play the single three, player. Probably three hours. But you're usually jumping a multiplayer. Right? Oh yeah. You're usually yeah. playing competitive multiplayer against other human beings, and mm-hmm. so the story is always backseat with Call of Duty. Always, yeah. right? They 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 do. Uh, they do the single player story, and it's not usually more than like five to a ten hour experience. Right. And they're not really they're kind of kind of throwing that in there because they know you're going to play that for a few hours and then say screw it, I got to get competitive, I got to get online. So I don't know how they're going to uh, capitalize off of that experience for a two to two and a half hour long. Oh, narrative. it's very easy to do. Yeah. You walk into the theater and you get a headset when you see the movie, <laughs> and then you just talk crap to other. some thirteen year old that lives in Ohio. That'd be the way I'd want to see the Call of Duty movie. It's just to go back and forth with verbal jabbing, which is most of online gameplay, Clark. Yeah, I think um, I think my bigger question for if I would want to see a movie like this or if this is a thing that makes sense. Yes, it sounds like they're finding they're going after um, high profile director talent and probably a cl- we, when we see the movie acclaimed director talent. But the question is, what about this makes it Call of Duty? That that's my question. Like if um, and the so logo. the logo exactly <laughs> yeah. exactly. And so I think that's that's going to be a really important. But if I had to guess, I would imagine that. Uh, Activision is probably working very closely in tandem with the movie studio and perhaps they will create together a narrative that you know fans can recognize from the game but also apply to the film. And then you have the movie based on the video game then you have the video game coming out based on the movie. Synergy. That's the marketing brain. Synergy. Organic synergy. Uh, We also have a Tetris movie coming out that we're not going (laughs) to talk about but there's a trilogy of Tetris movies if you don't play the war movies. Never. I'm the best Tetris player that ever lived. There Just ask John Schnapp. I'm going to beat you, Mark Ellis. Sure. We haven't even played yet. He's afraid to play me. That's how he likes to talk about it. He's great. It's adorable mm-hmm. when little kids have a dream. Yeah. Uh, we're going to go from video game movies into something that's more of a hard-hitting drama, but you might be surprised as to who's cast in it, and that is Deadline reporting. Melissa McCarthy is finalizing a deal to join and star alongside Tiffany Haddish in The Kitchen, a movie that will be based on the comic book series by Ollie Masters and Ming Doyle for DC's Vertigo. The Kitchen is an Irish mafia story set in Hell's Kitchen, New York in the 1970s after the FBI sweep catches some mob leaders forcing their wives to take over. The movie will be helmed by straight out of Compton writer Andrea Burloff, who that's going to be her feature film debut from a script penned by her as well. No release date has been set. The log line says wives end up running the illicit business in more vicious fashion than their husbands ever did. The headline to me in this story is that it's going to be more of a hard-hitting drama, and you have Melissa McCarthy and Tiffany Haddish in there. So the real question becomes, is this one of those situations where we like seeing people who we know primarily for comedic purposes and who are great in those roles translate into drama? It happens a lot of time with comedic actors when they want to stretch their wings and they want to do something a little more dramatic. Clark Wolf is the kitchen, the right vehicle from what it sounds like for Melissa McCarthy and Tiffany Haddish. I, I love this. I love this um, and not to keep plugging the podcast but we were talking about this with Good Morning Vietnam <laughs> mm-hmm. like the idea that you know we should it's it's a it's unfortunate and it we shouldn't put comedic actors in a box because oftentimes when they deliver incredible dramatic performances whether it's Robin Williams or Jim Carrey in Eternal Sunshine or Eddie Murphy in Dreamgirls or would pick one um, the, the they're so impressive and I just love that that these women are you know in a position where they are saying no one's going to put me in a box. I don't want to be put in a box. So let's find a property that is interesting and engaging and completely something that no one would ever think of us for. And let's crush it. And let's work with a first time director who happens to be a woman. Like I just, I, I love all of this. And I feel like when you have actors who are sort of um, hot, you know, like Tiffany Haddish is super hot right now and Melissa McCarthy is a force in this industry. When they truly are passionate about something, it shows. And something tells me that this is a project that both of these women are probably really passionate about and so I have a feeling they're going to really show up for it. It it seems like a hard buy for you. It's a very soft buy for me for no other reason because I give them all the credibility in the world and I think they can pull off a great dramatic role. But if I read this idea... It sounds like it's just so ripe for comedy. It's like when I you know. go to an Italian restaurant and they serve you like bread with cheese on it, and it's like, that's good. Oh, Can we just have tomato sauce? And then we make it pizza. Like the tomato, it's right there. I can't it's, believe this, you, Mark. This could be, but it could be so funny. I this could be like a you. hilarious movie. I, but I, I love them so much that I'm going to give it a very soft buy. Schnepp, 
Are you as soft as the dough as I am? Uh, no, you know what? And the, the oven was on, and I'm all cooked up now. You know what I was thinking about? Because I have not read The Kitchen, and then the more I thought about it, the more I want to see Melissa McCarthy holding that knife like Joe Pesci, maybe, you know, yeah. in Goodfellas. <laughs> I could see that line of, of – because Melissa McCarthy and Tiffany Haddish are just naturally funny. And there's no way that even if they're in, like, like the toughest, hard-as-nails thing, that they're not going to be – bringing out some of that humor, even in hard situations. So I can't help but think more about it. Like when I first heard it, I was like, I don't know if I like it because I love Melissa McCarthy making me laugh. I love Tiffany Haddish making me laugh because they're so innately funny that they bring out that kind of, that humor that I could see them playing real parts even better. Like it's like some actors have, have tried to push themselves. Like for Jim Carrey, Eternal Sunshine is the greatest role, a straight role he's ever played, not funny. Then you go to like 23 and you're like, please don't do that again. So <laughs> you have, every actor has their hits and misses. I'd like to see them hit it out of the park, so to speak, with a you know baseball reference there. This there I appreciate the sports <laughs> reference. This is going to come down to marketing, Nick, because the way that Eternal Sunshine was marketed is this is a serious, dramatic mm -hmm. role, and we we accepted that. Something like the Truman Show, a lot of people walked in not knowing what to expect, how funny is this going to be, how dramatic. Right. Man on the Moon, I remember seeing that movie and people walking out and saying, that was terrible because they didn't know what they were getting into. They thought they were seeing the guy from Ace Ventura right. be in a movie in the same vein with this when I saw the Melissa McCarthy movie Tammy that went for a lot more dramatic serious notes than I was expecting and I was turned off by it because the marketing campaign is telling me this is just another zany comedy so isn't it really up to the marketing department to let us know if this is dramatic that Tiffany and Melissa are not going to be doing the crazy make em ups like they've done in previous movies absolutely and I think they can pull it off I think they've got a great team with this and there's, there's nothing saying that neither, either of these actresses can't pull off a dramatic role I want this so badly to be a comedy though because I legitimately want to be able to say if you can't can't take the heat. Stay out of the kitchen. <laughs> oh, it's a it's a good line. Thank I you. like that. This Thank you, Mr. Tagline. All last night, Nick Scarpy thinking that one up. <laughs> Practiced that All one in the night. mirror yeah. when he was not making his debut on an upcoming episode of the Josh McCuga Show. We have one more buy or sell to get to, and that is quickly a trailer for the Quiet One. Is it the Quiet One? Is it the Quiet, quiet place? place? The hell is this movie called? It quiet One's a western. It, I mean, it, it looks like the the horror movie to beat in 2018. It's directed by John Krasinski and also stars him. The trailer came out and it's it looks like it could be a monster movie or it could be something a little more nefarious. I love the premise of this movie. I love the trailers, the marketing I've seen for this movie. It doesn't come out till April. So without being too, you know, trying to get into what the story is actually going to tell, my simple question to everybody here is a, do you buy or sell the trailer? And B, do you think that this could be the sleeper comedy or, excuse me, horror hit like what Get Out was, like what Split was, and like The Witch was? John Schnepp. It could. It definitely, I mean, the trailers have the, that kind of tension to it, which is like, you know, I mean, it, I'm, so, I'm so pulled because when I went and saw The Witch, The Witch has a lot of quiet moments in it. And if you have a very disrespectful studio audience, which I did, the people talking, it just, it just mm -hmm. will ruin the film. So I'm hoping that a quiet place, people don't, you know, talk during the movie because there will be blood if that happens. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so it's sort of like, I look, the second trailer already sold me. I didn't need to see all of it because I saw the first trailer and I was like, wow, I can't wait to see this. It looks like a cool, interesting take on a horror movie, like stuck in a, stuck in a house, you gotta be quiet. Is it like weird snipers outside? Is it an invisible monster of the id? What is it? I don't know, but I mean, it's, a, it's like good casting, him and his wife, you know, Emily Blunt, she's already an incredible actress. So it's like, let's make a movie together, perfect. Uh, Clark, would you prefer seeing this with John Schnepp in a very quiet theater with nobody talking or like me where we debut our Call of Duty headsets? <laughs> no headsets. <laughs> no headsets for this one. No. Uh, this is going to be a quiet movie. Quiet place. Quiet street. <laughs> Uh, okay, so here's the thing with this one. Uh, I I didn't watch the second trailer on purpose uh, because I this is a movie that I want to know as little about as possible. I did watch the first teaser and the first trailer. Um, I have two concerns. My first one is that this is from Paramount, and Paramount also gave us Mother and mm -hmm. pitched that as a horror movie to the audience, and it is not a horror movie, and it is not. It, it's very it's its own thing, and whether you like it or not, fine but I don't want that to be a similar thing with this. My other concern is um, there was a movie that came out last year that was super hyped and had a wonderful trailer 
called um, It Comes at Night. Mm -hmm. uh, that was from A24. Uh, you and I get spar about this all the time. I love disagreeing with you, you occasionally. Yes, occasionally. <laughs> um, but, you know, ultimately, um, to me, that was a movie that didn't pay off. And um, and so I am hopeful that with something like this, it's not one of those, you know, for lack of a better term, A24, like, oh, but is it all in your mind? And it's like, <laughs> OK, well, I don't like yeah, how many times do I need to see this? It same? ends with Krasinski getting out of the shower like it was all a dream. Exa or like, yeah, exactly. So I have high, high hopes for this one. Um, and I am also not going to be distracted or get my expectations set for something based on a marketing campaign because I am refusing to watch any marketing. It's interesting you bring up It Comes at Night because that actually goes back to the previous topic we were talking about too where it was a movie that I thought was great but maybe wasn't marketed to what the movie Very actually was. Do you smell something like that with this movie or do you think they're selling it to a straight? No, I think what you see is what you get with this trailer and I'm very stoked about this movie. And I want, uh, I know a lot of people that if this movie were real, if this were the reality, would die instantly instantly because they're way too loud. <laughs> way too, pretty much all my friends. Yeah, I'd be so, instantly dead. Oh, I'd be like God, eating a I Dorito. Would, yeah. What? I, I, Which I, I, one whatever. of us survives that the most, do you think? I Not have me. been quiet for three weeks before because I had surgery on my voice and couldn't Clark talk. wins. So I remember I, that. I would last for at least three weeks because I know I can do it. I'm not giving it like, I'm really a quiet guy when I'm no, off. you're dead. <laughs> you're dead. <laughs> Sorry. You're brother. talking you're to yourself, dead. muttering to yourself. You think you're quiet. You're the loudest yeah. dude I know. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm quiet when I, like, I, I, I nap a lot. So okay. I nap a lot, but here's the problem is that, and this is a problem with a quiet place too, is that what if you're one of those people like me who has been accused in the past of talking in your sleep? Mm -hmm. I, I will say that I will verbalize full, I'll say full paragraphs. I don't get up and sleepwalk. Like I'm not putting pillows into the oven like it's Step Brothers, <laughs> but I will say stuff <laughs> and yeah. occasionally it involves dragons. When I was a kid, a lot of the times my mom would hear me talking in my room. She'd come in and she'd be like, Mark, what's, and I'd be asleep and I'd say, mommy, I have to defeat the dragon. And wow. I would say that time and time time again. As far as I know, it doesn't relate to any drug addiction that I had, but it was just, I was a big fan of Mario Brothers, and I had to defeat the dragon. Beat what do you the want dragon. Yeah. <laughs> so I did not, not defeat the dragon, but I did enjoy the trailer for The Quiet Place. A Quiet Place? The Quiet Place? <laughs> a, quiet a, quiet place. a Quiet Place. A Quiet Acorn? It's, it's <laughs> one of many Quiet Acorns or places. We're going to save some time at the end for your live Twitter questions. So go ahead and start tweeting us right now. Use the hashtag Collider Movie Talk and include us here at Collider Video. I do want to remind everybody that later on today, right here, on Collider Video, you can catch an all-new episode of John Schnapp hosting Heroes, the oh, Sweaties right. of the Sweaties. What do we got on tap today? Oh, we're going to talk about a little uh, film uh, Tim Miller is going to be making, uh, written by um, uh, Brian Michael Bendis, called 143. Tune in. Ooh, is that the kid? That's a Kitty Pride movie. We uh, uh, um, yeah, maybe. Yeah. 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 There you go. We also have the uh, uh, Black Panther non-spoiler review is currently up on the channel. We'll have plenty more Black Panther content, including a spoiler heavy review once the movie comes out. And like I said, the live movie talk that we're doing this weekend in downtown Los Angeles, which you can still attend, uh, we're going to have footage of that up on the channel, hopefully sometime next week. And an all-new Schmodown dropped yesterday, so check out all the latest going-ons in the movie trivia Schmodown. Without further ado, let's get to the Twitter. Twitter, and it, this is a good question because it goes back to something that we were talking about earlier. Jonathan Peck writes and says, which current comedian actor should have a turn in dramas? Which one do you want to see make that dramatic leap? For Jonathan Peck, it's Will Forte. Oh, hmm. yeah. Uh, Clark Wolf, you like that? I mean, he, he already kind of did Nebraska? it in uh, Nebraska. Yeah. yeah. And he's yeah. also got a movie out now on Netflix, The uh, Stupid and Futile right. Gesture, right? Is that yeah. Wolf Forte? I'm it's about right. the founding of National Lampoon, yeah, right? Which is, yeah, it's very, very good. Yeah. And I've comedic elements, good. but predominantly. Yeah, I heard that uh, another guy that, who I might have my eye on for something like that would be Joel McHale because he mm -hmm. plays Chevy Chase he plays in there. Phenomenally. And uh, I heard it's really good. Everyone they got for Bill Murray, Chevy Chase, the original cast, they don't look like them, but they are them. It's very well done. It's very straight. Joel McHale, not the least of which, is phenomenal as Chevy Chase. Yeah, I want to see somebody like like Keegan Michael Key because he's yeah. just he he's just so naturally mm. funny. Like like as soon as he he walks into a room or he's on screen, like you just you just smile and it just warms your heart. So I want to see that turned on its ear a little bit. I want to mm. see if he plays somebody who's a little more nefarious, who's a little maybe even a villain in something. Just because I'd be I like I want to see him be like a Bond villain because he just seems like somebody who could hatch a scheme. And I, I want to see something like that from him. He's made me laugh. I want to see him do something else. John Schnapp, who you got? 
The only person that comes to my mind is Jim Gaffigan, but oh, make yes. make him play like a really horrible boss, like like he's like in charge of a Denny's or something. But he's just like that boss that you hate. He's like, can you put this clean the counter again? You're not doing anything. Oh, he's making you do busy work. Like, can you just restock the like that kind of boss that you hated when you were like in high school and you had somebody like telling you to do the dishes and stuff? It's like I had that experience. So I was like, yeah, throw Gaffigan in there, make him the 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 boss that everybody hates. I'm buying big on Gaffigan. Who you got? Clark? I want to see more drama from Ray Ramon. Romano. I yeah. love mm. Ray Romano when he so. plays it straight. Mm. And uh, I think he's way more talented than mm. anyone gives yeah, him credit like, for. Dabra. Yeah, I know. I know. He, he's right, got but, all. Yeah, exactly. But I would like to see that. Um, okay, so Jay Scott St. Clair is going to close us off here for the show. And it's an apropos question today. It says, choose your favorite rom-com character to be your Valentine. So I'm going to uh, excuse mine. everybody in the room of your current relationship in real life. Now you get to go to rom-com land. And you get to pick anybody from a romantic comedy oh. to be your Valentine Clark Wolf. You seem like you want to go first. Yep, I know exactly who it is. It's Mark Ruffalo in 13 going on 30. <laughs> he is just a dreamboat and so cute and sweet. And just, oh, I just, mm, mm, I just he's so, I just want. Mm. What are you grabbing? Is it, are well, those he cheeks? Just, he's, yeah, I just want to. You're just like, pinching cheeks? Pinch his little cheeks and give him a kiss. And um, he's so cute. And All so, right. yeah. Wait, well, also, he's just very, um, I don't know. I can't explain his character in that movie, but he's he's soft without being a pushover, and mm. like he's just uh, and he's reluctant. He's marrying another woman, but he really uh -oh. loves Jennifer Garner, and you know oh, I just love him. Mm, just be careful you don't get his heart rate too high because uh, he could turn green and giant. Uh, John Schnepp. Uh, does Molly's game count as a rom com? Because I'm picking Jessica Chastain. She hasn't really no, been in a rom com. Like you're cheating. I know. I, I, <laughs> right. I, I guess uh, yeah, I'm cheating. <sighs> Yeah, on Holly with Molly's game. Holly's game. It's always Holly's game. No, you're not cheating on Holly. You're cheating on the game. That's yeah. that's not a romantic comedy. Uh, come back to me. Okay, we're gonna come back to. I'm not. I'm not letting you get away with Jessica Chastain. Nick Scarpino. Who is your rom com? Crush I would like to land squarely in between Aston Kutcher and Natalie Portman from, and I want to say it was called Friends with Benefits, but I can't. I get that one confused with the Justin, the Justin Timberlake, Timberlake one. Uh, <laughs> one that he did. So we'll just call it Friends with Benefits until the chat. There was no strings attached. That's with Ashton Kutcher. Yes. Maybe the one I'm thinking of. Yeah. Then. And yeah. then you had the uh, the Friend, other one. Friends with Benefits Friends with, with Mila Justin Kunis Tim Timberlake and, and Mila yeah. Kunis. Yeah. yeah, so you're taking Mila Kunis. No, oh, I'm taking, taking Nat, Nat Portman, Aston Kutcher, right in the middle. Oh, good. Okay. That's what I want to Well, be. I'm taking Mila Kunis well, they, from, right. from the other one. I'm, I'm, taking, one. I'm taking all the ladies from Girls' Night Out. That it, sounds like uh, another one of them. sheet. No, uh, yeah. any one of them. Okay. I could take any one of them. Any one of them from Girls' Night, from Girls' Trip? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, Girls' Trip. Okay, all right. So you have like nine Valentines. Yeah. Okay. John Schnepp wins the game yet again because <laughs> he is the most Valentine's. That is going to do it for us here on this Valentine's Day edition of Collider Movie Talk. Thank you guys so much for participating in the chat room and the comment section. Leave a comment. Let us know. Be constructive with it. We love reading them. Thank you guys for all your participation. Thank you to our hardworking crew for being here and taking care of us with all the cool new shots and graphics we have. And thank you, last but certainly not least, to my incredible panel today. First of all, John Schnepp, where can the kids find you? You guys can find me on Instagram, Facebook, all that stuff, at John Schnepp on Twitter. And uh, check out my uh, YouTube channel, The Schnepp Zone. The Schnepp Zone, classy Clark Wolf, Sending the Wolf, starring Mark Ellis. We're talking about Good Morning Vietnam. Where can the kids find it? They can find it on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, etc. Just search Sending the Wolf. It's very hard to articulate instead of send in, sending. It's hard to, you know. Sending. Sending. Uh, <laughs> and you can find me at Clark Wolf, Clark with an E, Wolf with an E. And thank you for having me. Whole lot of E's. Great having you as always. And last but not least, again, Nick Scarpino. Where can, can the kids check you out? You can find me on Twitter at Nick underscore Scarpino because there is another Nick Scarpino and he's better at social media than me. <laughs> and if you want to see our content, you can check us out on youtube.com slash kind of funny or for gaming content, youtube.com slash kind of funny games. Make sure you guys follow all the things that Nick is involved in because you might see this ugly face pop up on one of them sooner rather than later. I am merely Mark Ellis. You can follow me at Mark Ellis Live and get tickets to the upcoming stand-up comedy dates. Mark Ellis Live dot com. Portland, I'll see you in a few weeks. Until then, tomorrow is a new Collider Movie Talk. Hey everybody, Mark Ellis here. Thanks for watching this episode of Collider Movie Talk. You want to watch more? Then click up here or you can click right here for more great content from Collider. And if you haven't subscribed to Collider Video, do so right now and share this vid with your friends. Thanks for watching.